Hey, friends, Darren Bailey coming uh, to you today with another exciting episode of information to educate you, to inform you, to empower you. And today I am honored to have as our guest uh, Joel Hackney. He is superintendent of uh, Flora Unit 35 in Flora, Illinois. I've known Joel for quite some time. He's very active uh, in our communities here, and, and he's just an amazing, uh, amazing man. And uh, I have full faith, trust, and respect in him. So I invited him here today to basically talk and help us understand, you know, the full role of of a superintendent. Uh, you probably remember I served on the North Clay Unit 25 school board for 17 years, and and I do have immense respect for teachers, uh, for for principals, for administrators, uh, superintendents, those who serve uh, free of their time on the school board of education. It is imperative as we uh, educate uh, our future, our children. So uh, Flora does an amazing job, and today we're going to uh, enter into just a conversation. And and Joel, thank you so much for being here with us today. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invite, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I feel like I'm going to pay you for that introduction. That was nice. I don't know if all those things are true, but I appreciate it. No, <laughs> they are. E- excited to be here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity, and and as you mentioned, 17 years of board member. So thank you for your service and education, because that's a that's a lot of different uh, issues and challenges that come up over those times. So um, just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm originally from Florida, uh, went all the way through the Florida school system, graduated in 1994, um, went into education, started teaching in the middle of the year, 98, 99, all those fun subjects that the kids like to take to physics, chemistry, and math is what I taught. Um, I taught and coached for six years and um, decided I'm just going to get my principal degree, love it in the classroom, not in any hurry to use it. Um, one summer after my sixth year of teaching, they had an opening and said, when are you going to be finished? So um, I was actually finishing up my administrative degree while I was um, working with a retired guy that came back as an administrator. So I did that for four years as principal up north at Oka Valley, Bethany and Finley. Um, loved the principalship, thought I'll just get my specialist degree. Um, and then one night before a board meeting superintendent called and said, hey, I'm retiring after next year. Would you like to be the assistant superintendent, take over superintendent? So, you know, I, I'm really um, I'm blessed. feel like, you know, God provided the opportunities for me to, uh, um, you know, I got the degrees with no intent on being in a hurry to get into the administration, but uh, I was principal when I was 28 and superintendent when I was 32. And so this is my 15th year superintendent, had the opportunity um, when the floor job came open um, I don't know if it was in our plans, but, you know, that's where my parents live, where my wife's parents live, where she was from. Um, our kids were at the age they were getting ready to start school. So, you know, we thought, well, if if we're going to make the move back, now is the time to put my name in the hat. And again, fortunately, I was selected and um, couldn't couldn't have asked for a better um, homecoming, I guess, for lack of better terms. It's been it's been great for for me, been great for my family and uh, couldn't ask for a better community and a better school district to, to be a part of. So, Well, that's awesome. We are, we're blessed here in Clay County to have good schools and good people. And, and I know when I was serving as state representative during the, the, the COVID years and all that confusion, I'd, I'd call upon you a lot. And <laughs> we had several ask, conversations. Yes, yes we, we did. did. <laughs> get your opinion, get your thoughts, get your advice. So uh, thank you for you just being you. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the superintendency. What does, uh, there's a lot of, uh, sometimes confusion, you know, people, uh, people will come to me as a, as a, as a, uh, you know, elected official and say, Hey, come to our school and help me take care of this. Or they'll come sometimes directly sure. to the superintendent. I know it's a uh, tough being at ball games and public events. Sure. I know people like to come to you and rail and just, you snap your fingers and you fix all these problems, <laughs> but tell us what the superintendent does, what that position entails. Sure. And then we'll talk, go into the chain of command sure. and stuff like uh, that. So as you're right, I mean, ob- obviously, uh, Lots of opportunities to act, interact with people, and and you know you had kind of mentioned it's tough going to, to ball games and to Walmart and those types of things. I, I honestly don't mind that. Um, you know, my thought is unless we know if there's issues, it's hard to um, fix issues. Right. Um, the other thing is 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 sometimes the issues are a result of just really not understanding the rhyme and the reason or the rationale for why we do certain things, and so you know we. There, you don't always have to agree and people can agree to disagree and they can do it in a civil way, but I, I don't think you can ever over communicate. Um, and I've just said, we can, we can talk about the chain of command and, and there's times where they might catch me in a ball game. And my first question is, have you talked to that teacher? Have you talked to that principal? But, you know, I think just in a general sense, um, you know, there are days where the job of the superintendent is simply to try and figure out what I had on my list 
and I keep adding to my list and then maybe just try and consolidate my list because, you know, there's just a lot of different things that might come up during the year, during the day. But I think everything that I do, and I can kind of list some of the specific things that the superintendent's role entails, but everything that I do, and I think every thing that any educator, whether they're a superintendent, a teacher, a paraprofessional, a bus driver, custodian, everything we sh should be focused on is what, what is best for the students. Um, cause that's ultimately why we're in those positions. That's ultimately why the school district is there. That's why you serve 17 years on the board is, you know, it's not always going to be the easy decision. It's not always going to be the popular decision, but if at the end of the night, you can say that's the decision that's best for the students that you've been charged to be responsible for, you should be able to sleep pretty easy at night. And so, you know, I, I think ultimately that's, that's the overarching goal. Um, you know, the other thing I think as a superintendent that I try to do and certainly don't do it perfectly and could certainly do a better job at times is, you know, supporting all of the employees, all the students, all of the teachers, all the parents, you know, just making sure that they have the opportunity, whether it be resources or training or, um, knowledge or information or communication, just putting all of them in a position to be successful. Um, and then just continually trying to adjust on how we do that. Um, you know, obviously a big role of the superintendent is uh, policies for the school district. Big job of that is the budget, the finances, managing the current budget, making changes to it, adjusting when funding is less than what you thought it was going to be. And then obviously, um, you know, you, as you know, as a school board member, you might have been making um, – decisions on that school year, but you're always looking ahead to the next school year, and the next school year after that. And so I, I think there's a, there's a component of managing the district. There's a component of short-term planning. And then obviously there's long-term planning, because obviously if you're not looking down the road at what your policies need to be, what your funding is going to be about, you know, where do you need staffing resources? What other services can we offer to the students? Um, and, you know, and I think a part of it, as you, you mentioned, you and I talked a lot during COVID. Well, we didn't just talk uh, COVID time, we talked prior to that. And so, you know, there's obviously things that the legislature is involved in at the state level, at the federal level that have impacts on schools. So I, I think, you know, we're blessed to have, um, you know, obviously when you, when you were in that role and other legislators that do a good job of giving us a heads up on, Hey, this is what's coming down the pipeline or, Hey, this is what's being proposed. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How can we tweak this? How can we adjust that? So working hand in hand and, and, and trying to play a part in, shaping those policies at a state level and at a federal level that does exactly what we started with, helping support those students, I think is, is important. Yeah. Tell us about the relationship between the school board and mm -hmm. the superintendent. Well, again, I, I can't ask for, as I mentioned before, a better community or a better opportunity. And, and, and our school board is fantastic. Um, you know, uh, there, there's some really good training that the Illinois Association of School Boards puts out. And, and you probably participated in some of that when you were uh, in your role during the 17 years of board member. But, you know, one of the analogies that they use, and, and I think it's simplistic, but it's a kind of a good thing to remember. And, and, you know, there's, there's obviously different ways to structure this, but they kind of, they kind of use the uh, illustration, the analogy of a school board's kind of in the balcony and they're looking at those that are dancing on the dance floor. And then obviously the superintendent and then all the employees that are encompassed under the superintendent, the principals, the teachers, the paraprofessionals, all the employees, they're on the dance floor. Um, so, you know, the board's, main responsibility obviously is to monitor, to, to create the policies, to make sure that there's accountability, to make sure that we're doing exactly what we talked about, offering the best opportunities and resources for our students and our staff. Um, and, and I think that relationship works extremely well um, when there is trust between the superintendent and the board of education. And, and, and that relationship um, becomes a trusting relationship the same way any relationship does the same way you establish trust as a superintendent with your principals or with your teachers or with your parents or you know in, in a marriage the same way a husband and wife trust each other there's got to be open communication um you know and, and and again i think what what i've been blessed and fortunate with is you know you've served on a board of education when you have seven people you may have at least seven different opinions and maybe more because there's some times where you can look at an issue and go, well, gosh, I can see kind of both sides of that. I don't even know where I stand as a board member or superintendent. But, you know, I, I think what is imperative for a board superintendent relationship to lead to the success of a school district is there has to be that trust relationship between the board members. There has to be that trust relationship between the board and superintendent. There has to be the ability to openly discuss things to agree, to disagree on things. You know, Motorola used to have a slogan, the way to get good ideas is to get a lot of ideas. And so that's that's really what we try to do. And, um, you know, so I, I think, again, I couldn't ask for a better situation. 
Um, and, and I think in any situation, whether it's a group of legislators, where it's a group of board members, where it's uh, teachers in a building, I think as long as there can be trust and that leads to civil, productive, open dialogue, and you can all come to consensus and you may walk out of there thinking that's not exactly the way I wanted it to happen. But at the end of the day, I think it's best. It's what's going to be good for students. Not That's what I think needs to happen. Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes we see that not talking school board or superintendent, but just in society. I think we see that happening less and less um, where people can truly just have open conversations and and come to a, a consensus. But I, I mean, I think that's, that's imperative. I think, um, you know, if you had a school board where all seven members and the superintendent always agreed, that's probably not great uh, because you're not getting any other perspectives or any things to look at, but you also have to have a relationship where, you know, it, it's a democratic system, just like our, our country was based upon. Right. And so, you know, you have those discussions, the board decides what the best direction is, and then you move forward and do what's best for the students and the staff. I love that civil, open, productive dialogue, even, even now, uh, post, uh, Illinois legislator, I have a lot of people calling me, wanting advice, wanting me to show up, wanting, and, and, and that's what I'll always, have you, have you attended a meeting? Have you, you know, let your voice be known in a civil, open, sure. productive uh, way? And many times it's not because we do, we're, we're so used to, uh, I, I don't know if it's social media or the internet, uh, we want results now, we can order something and have it on our doorstep but tomorrow. And, and I think when people have problems, uh, you know, this whole process of life hinders that because they want to see, they want their opinion known now and they want to see results now. Sure. And, uh, and, and I mentioned earlier, and, and, and again, um, you know, I, I have some people that will come to me and say, hey, I, I hate to complain or I don't want to be negative or whatever. And, and again, you know, I, I've been married long enough to know that not all of my ideas are good ideas. So um, just because somebody doesn't necessarily see something the way that I do, or have the same idea that I do, does, doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. Um, again, they may have an idea, I may have an idea, and honestly, the best solution may be, hey, I, I think that's a pretty good perspective, and that's pretty good. So they're somewhere, you know, in a compromise of both of our ideas may be the best solution going forward, and those are the things that we have to to look for. Yeah, I'll never forget to, when I sued J.B. Pritzker on the COVID lockdowns, I had never been in a courtroom on a, a you know, a, I don't believe any time in my life. So, you know, I used that opportunity to tell people, good grief, show up <laughs> during court day and set in and so watch this process of government sure. work out. I encourage people, go right. to a school board meeting. Matter of fact, go to one per quarter. Just set sure. in, listen, understand what's taking place, see the frustrations that, uh, you know, the board and the school's wrestling with, uh, participate in some of the joys and achievements. Right. And and I think that's very important because when we when we set out sometimes and sit on the sidelines and become, you know, these uh, uh, social media warriors, uh, then it, that I think sometimes that's when trouble arises. Sure. Cindy started the PTO, you know, in, in Louisville when we were there. We were we had another group that started an amazing called Watchdogs, Dads of Great Parents, where every day of the school year, you know, a dad would uh, would participate. You got your background checks and you'd come and and it was just amazing the the love and attention that these young students uh, from kindergarten on up, usually just in elementary, would would would, would you be desiring so right. involvement. It's Absolutely. all about involvement. So I do I, uh, I I really appreciate the people that ran for school board this last go around, Absolutely. and in two years there'll be more opportunity. Sure. And and usually only until you become part of the <laughs> process do you really truly understand and and have respect and appreciation for for what's going on. So Absolutely, and I think. You again, you found this in all your different endeavors when you first got on the school board and probably even when you were still on there as a veteran board member, when you first got in legislation, as you mentioned, going through the court process. Um, you know, and I, again, I, this is my 10th year in the Florida district, but there's still times where these are the questions that I have to ask myself and the board continues to ask as we look at, you know, our long-term strategic planning. Why, why do we do it this way? Is that still the way that is best for our district and our students to do it? Um, or other ways to improve our process, right? And, and so, you know, like you said, I think when you get involved and you ask those questions or you become a school board member for the first time or you just start attending and ask those questions, again, it, it, there's not a problem asking, well, why do you do that? Because there may be a very good reason why, you know, sometimes we might want to do things a different way. It's just not legal or practical or whatever. So, I mean, I, I think you always have to look at those um, things. And, and again, our, our board does a fantastic job. We, we obviously just went through school board election. We'll have a couple of new members and, you know, I'm looking forward to, um, new perspectives and, and them, 
looking at those policies with a fresh set of eyes and, and kind of seeing what we can do to continually improve our district. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, I got off the school board 11 years ago and you started as a superintendent 15 years ago. A lot's changed. A lot has changed. Then. Yes. Give me your perspective on education today. Um, you know, I think our board does a great job of, of trying to provide uh, a, a good education. Our community is very supportive. Our staff is fantastic. I've mentioned to them on more than one occasion, um, and it's not just lip service. I would put our staff up against any other staff um, that you want to stack them up against because they're they're in it for a heart for kids. Um, they go above and beyond to, to do what you know, we can to support the families and the community, the kids. And so I I appreciate that. I think, you know, the things have changing changed, um, you know, in the 15 years I've been in education and and since your time on the school board, and even as a legislature, we see the funding kind of ebb and flow. Uh, We went through times where funding was pretty consistent. Uh, We saw times where funding was very delayed and prorated and uh, late in getting it. When sure if you're going to getting it, we're we're at a time now where actually funding for education is pretty decent. Um, But I think probably the biggest thing that I see that's different now, this is my, um, if you add up all those, what would that be? 25th that year in education. Um, you know, I, I think, um, and and you obviously, I, I know looked and talked a lot about this, you know, and, and, um, obviously your role as a legislature when you run for governor, but, you know, I, I think we see way more mental health needs of students and, and not just students, but families, um, that obviously, we have to find community resources to help with, but also the school has has had to look at, um, understandably and, and justifiably so, how do we try and provide those mental health services to those kids? I mean, we we both know that you have to meet the physical and the mental and the safety needs of the kids before you can even get to the learning needs, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at that yeah. hierarchy of learning, if they don't feel safe, if they're not um, you know, in a place mentally or physically where they feel like they're safe and supported, it's going to be difficult for them to learn. And so, I mean, those are things that, for them to be able to learn and cope, we've got to adjust. And so I think there's probably way more of a focus because of where we're at right now, just, you know, society wise on, on trying to provide those mental health services. Um, you know, I think the other thing that is different from when I started is, um, it used to be when I first started as a principal, if I had an elementary position that was open, there would also almost need to be a a separate mail truck to deliver all the applications that I would get for elementary applications. And and you could get applications, maybe not to that degree for all the positions. I mean, I, I think you could probably pick your business, pick your job that somebody's posting. It's difficult to find right. um, people to fill positions and that th- education is no exception. Um, so I think that's another big challenge is just trying to um, recruit good um, candidates for positions, trying to get, some of the youngest, brightest to go into education uh, just to fill the future needs. I mean, that's that's something I think if you asked any district, not just in our state, but probably across our nation, and again, any industry, any job, it's just we're facing a a shortage of people that are going into those jobs. And so, you know, to me, that's concerning, not just because I'm looking at the immediate future and saying we got to fill these positions. But again, I think it all goes back to as a school district, you want to do what is best for the students and you want to educate them and you want to make sure that whatever they want to do, whether it's going into the workforce, going into the armed forces, going into uh, college or whatever, we want to prepare them to do that. And and from the time that they come into our schools as pre-K and kindergartners to the time they graduate, we need uh, great educators to do that. And so, you know, I think the state of education now, we just have to find ways to look at grow your own initiatives. We have to look at ways to try and attract people, to try and retain uh, people into education. And and part of that is, you know, we can look at where we're at in a society today. We can look at where education's at compared to where it was, you know, 28 years ago when you first got on the board. Um, and sometimes if we get caught up in the things, how it used to be and how it is today, we're not the greatest advocates for trying to convince people to go into the field of education. And so, you know, I probably could do a better job of that. Um, and and I think we, we have to do that. We have oh, to do that. I appreciate that, especially you're a product of of growing right. up in Florida and coming back. And we did the same thing at Louisville. We encouraged, found these students that were interested in education, encouraged right. them to go get their education degree and, and come back to Louisville. And and it is amazing in a lot of communities throughout the state. Uh, I hear a lot of people, st- that, that some communities want to hire outside so they can bring in more ideas. And I just... Uh, uh, you know, that, that, that concerns me because, uh, many communities are, Absolutely. you know, they're, they're, they're who they are because of the people that are there right. and what better, uh, what better option to bring oh. someone, one of the former students back in Absolutely. To, to build upon that. I think it's great for the community when they come back and then they start their family. And, and, and I think obviously, as you mentioned, 
a byproduct of the school district that knows that history, um, knows what they um, experience in school. Th- those are ideas yeah. that are that are great yep. and and uh, makes makes it great whenever they come back. And uh, you know that was a big big uh, factor when my wife and I were deciding if you know if we wanted to come back. I mean, you know, one of the things we talked about was being able to raise our kids in the community we grew up right. in. So, yep, we hear a lot of talk today about low test scores mm-hmm. across Illinois. Give me your take. What's what's uh, what's your take on that? What is the solution to that? What are we missing here? I think the take on that is, you know, I, I think obviously there has to be some accountability in ways that you measure um, the success of the students. And again, I'll, I'll I'll say that because, again, what I said is our job as educators is to prepare those students for whatever it is that they want to do. Um, now, I think we also have to understand that not every student is going to go to a four-year college Absolutely. university, right? which is why, you know, when that funding um, in years past wasn't there, unfortunately, we saw some school districts take some of the low-hanging fruit, and some of those were the classes that were probably more um, more beneficial to those students that were going to four universities. And, and, of course, we know that if somebody went into a vocational area right now, they could probably have as much work as they wanted and the hourly rate that they – so, you know, there are great opportunities for students – to enter the workforce, to get, you know, an apprenticeship right out of school or, or whatever. So, um, you know, I think we have to look at, are we truly um, ensuring that the students have the skill sets that they need when they come out of school? So, um, you know, I think obviously the disadvantage you hear this ar- argued all the time is, you know, you can't really measure success by one test one day, um, just because it's one test one day. I, I don't think any of us would want to be measured on a day of our lives and say, that's what your whole life has been based upon. And that's, you know, that's kind of the downside to high stakes, one test accountability. Now, one of the things that we do um, is, you know, to to me, that's kind of like a basketball coach at the end of the season, looking at the free throw stats and going, oh, I guess we weren't very good at free throws. Well, no, they, they're monitoring that as they go. So we, we embed more of the local assessments to make sure that the students are truly performing. So we can look at that and say, okay, they didn't get that very well, or we need to cover this better. We also look at how we can align our curriculum from one grade level to the other. Um, now, I do think, you know, obviously what you mentioned, the COVID, we we went through a time in 2020 where the last two and a half months of school were remote. Um, we went through a time that next year where, um, you know, I don't even know how you could describe that. And <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of things we'd probably like to forget about that last year. But, you know, we saw the lack of instructional time and the mode of instruction and students attendance was affected greatly. And so, you know, I do think that the COVID slide is real. I think um, when you have kids that are there for less time, that is not getting the interaction on a daily basis with the teachers in person. Again, I'd put what our staff did remote learning up against anybody. Uh, our technology coordinator is fantastic in looking at opportunities for technology that we can use in instructional tools. So we were situated in a position to where, you know, as smooth as you can make remote instruction transition, we were in a position to do it. I mean, we had the Chromebooks, we had the infrastructure, we had already taught students a lot of how to do that, but it's still not a substitute for having a teacher right there who can interact and engage with and read um, the students. And so, you know, I, I think, um, we're starting to see a little bit of effect of that, um, but I also know that we're working extremely hard and uh, vigorously to try and get those scores up. And and again, my my thought is we we want to look at all of that not so that we can say, hey, look how good our test scores are. We want to do that because we want to make sure that our students have the opportunity for success. Um, and I think also as a part of that is we have to make sure that people realize, hey, you, you can go to North Clay School District, you can go to Clay City School District, you can go to Florida School District, and you can still do whatever you mm-hmm. want to do. Um, right. I mean, you 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 know you don't have to be um, in a in a suburb school to go. I mean, you know, we we could all point to North Clay and Florida students that have went out and done great things and been successful. We just have to make sure that we're putting them in a position that they have the resources, the training, the opportunity, the knowledge to do whatever it is that they want to do. Yep, and that is the power of a local school, local control. Yes. You know, when I was on the school board, I used to always tell the when we would hire a bus driver or we would hire a custodian, I'd always tell them, I said, you may be the most important That's exactly person right. because that may be the first face of our school district yes. that the student says. Sure. And I always remember me personally being a farmer, you know, wearing work clothes most of the time. I always appreciated the fact when the custodian custodian was walking down the halls, you know, with a mop in his hand or whatever. And, and, and they, they, they'd acknowledge you, you know, and then they'd learn your name. And I just, and you could have, 
conversations with them. And gosh, the the role of a teacher, no no more noble profession on the face of this earth. And what what one teacher can do to a student, yep. for a student, to empower, to embolden them. And I truly believe, and I love, even though the state comes out, and and that's you know that's what I encourage people all the time is to let your voice be known and make sure that your elected officials truly represent your area and that you stay in touch with them because right. you know right now as we talk, uh, legislation is being enacted in Springfield and and for for gosh for a for a for this local control for for you and I being able to conduct business conduct education in our communities as we desire uh, that's truly where it's at and we have that freedom here in Illinois if we stand and 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 you know work within that sure. authority and if our school board members our superintendents our principals we stand up and and sometimes we might have to can I say no the state says this but we're going to do it a little bit of a different way and sure. and uh, I, I just I've advocated for less government in our schools and let our schools because uh, right. all of our communities are different sure. so and and I think again um, our our staff is fantastic I think you know we we've had the ability um, to add several electives. Um, we're able to offer some electives, even though we're we're a smaller school district compared to some of the others in the state of Illinois that um, that others may not have the opportunity to do. And I know in a lot of those vacational programs, they'll have different um, visits to businesses and people that have successfully started businesses or created industries in those fields. Um, you know, and, and if, if if it's a student that is going to go on to college, we are fortunate to have a lot of dual credit classes. So a lot of our students can walk in and they're already sophomores or they almost have an associate's by the time that they leave. And that's huge because they've already got a leg up. Um, you know, it, it's a whole lot less of a cost to that student or to that, you know, family when they've already got a lot of those classes that they've been able to take. So again, I think, I think we do a great job of that. Um, but we always, number one, could look at ways to improve in that. And number two, we have to understand, um, there's not one track. There's many different right. roads, and we just have to try and provide as right. much resources we can. And, and again, our, our board and our administration, our staff, have done a great job. That's awesome. I want to hit on school funding okay. before we wrap up. Uh, I know 11 years ago when I got off the school board, uh, here in our area, we were, you know, we were uh, educating children for around 10 to 12,000 per student. Mm -hmm. In those days, uh, Chicago public schools and, and you know, <laughs> were spending 18 to 20, you know, right. a little almost double what we were. Today, I think we're still spending 10 to 12, and Chicago public schools are pushing $30,000 right. per student. Talk about the, the, the funding process, what could, should be different, um, what talk about that. And, and as, as we mentioned, that kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. Um, a few years ago, obviously, the state shifted a little bit back before the evidence-based funding went into effect. It was primarily um, average daily attendance that ran your state funding. And there was a base foundation level. Every student would get a base foundation level based on your enrollment, based on your number of students, and then it was based on average daily attendance. And, and of course, the problem that we ran into was that figure was never really adjusted. And um, attendance was not always necessarily the greatest um, indicator and, and enrollment simply because um, a school district that had a large number of students was going to get a large allocation of state aid. However, they also had a huge uh, tax base. And so they, they were blessed with a lot of funding from the state and they were also blessed with a huge local property tax base. And so um, obviously they were trying to be creative and find a way to spend the amount of money that they had to just get $30,000 per student. And so um, I do think three, four, maybe five years, time kind of gets away. When they shifted to the evidence-based funding, it was a more equitable way to fund it. And, and for a couple of reasons. One, because built into that um, was the expectation that it was going to hopefully be consistently funded. Um, you know, we know that when it used to be non-evidence-based funding, there was a couple of years where they prorated the state aid quite a bit. Well, if you're one of those larger school districts, obviously they weren't happy about their funding being cut, but when they had a huge property tax base, they had the ability to offset that way better than someone who doesn't have that local property tax base. And so the evidence-based funding looks at 26 different factors. Attendance is one of them, but they'll also look at, okay, what is your local property ability to support that school district? And, you know, that might put you in a different tier if your tax base isn't as high. Um, what's your special needs population? What's your ELL population? What's your um, low income population? All those populations that you're going to need funding to meet the needs of and to help educate, that gets factored in. And so that has been a plus. Um, you know, one of the other things, and again, it's all about the, you know, the legislature continuing to prioritize you know, they got a lot of things they have to try and juggle, but prior to ours in education, so whatever your funding was the year prior, that is supposed to be the base 
for the next year. So in other words, it's not supposed to go down. And if it ever does, it can't go below whatever it was when it started. So all those things I think have helped. Um, and, and so I think the last three or four years, I can say that the funding has been consistent. Um, you know, and, and again, one of the things, um, you know, obviously our junior high is, is, uh, named after Floyd Henson. And, and I think if you asked anybody who worked for Floyd Henson or know, or knew him, he was very, um, conscientious about being a good steward of the taxpayer's money and mm -hmm. making sure that we spent the money um, in, a, in a responsible way for education. And I think, you know, that is something that the Florida School District and the school board has continued to do. And, and to me, that's, that's probably what I think is one of the biggest things I have to do is making sure that I utilize the state resources and the tax money that we have and spend it in a responsible way, but still provide the resources. And, you know, sometimes you have to get creative. I mean, if, if somebody comes to me with something that says we need this for the student, I'm not going to promise I can always do it, but we're going to try and find a way if there's a resource that the student needs to be able to do that. And I think it's, it's been easier lately with the consistency of state funding, but I, I think whether the state funding is consistent or whether prorating, you always have to look at it and say, what's the best way to utilize every penny that we get? And, and at the end, is it, is it something that is good for our district, our community, and our students? And if it's not, you, you might not need to look at spending funding that way. But if it is, you need to find a way to try and make that happen. And I appreciate that. I think that's an excellent way to wrap up because I've constantly said and consistently said more money is not the answer. We can just, uh, you know, we, we, that's the way it is with life. We all think more money, more money. But if we're, if we're free – free of governmental regulations to do what we see necessary in our communities. And I think the schools here in Clay County have, uh, have proven that. And I, I give you credit for yeah. doing a, we, we always want more money, but when we see our, 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 you know, businesses and our, our people of Illinois being, uh, you know, pushed out of this state for less taxes and even sometimes more opportunity, I right. think then we have to address the real issue. And, and I think that we, we get that here in Southern Illinois right. and Clay County, for but, sure. uh, no, I appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, wrap things up with any final thoughts you have. I'd like to know your greatest frustration in education and then your greatest uh, accomplishment, the thing that gives <laughs> you most joy with education. Um, boy, greatest frustration. Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I guess the. Uh, I know you're naturally a super positive <laughs> I, I, guy. Sometimes I, yeah. that's a hard, that, that's hard. hard that's question. like asking my wife. She she'd have, but I just uh, um, yeah. Just I, you, you talked a lot about control, and, and again, I don't know that this is necessarily a frustration, but I I uh, I, I tend to be a little bitter if you ask my wife a lot. Uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive, and so you know. I'm not good ever when there's things I can't control. And obviously in education, you know, there's a lot of factors that control what you do on a daily basis, you know, there's the state and, and different things. And again, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's, it's just, you know, there are certain things that I have no control over. And, and I think I've gotten better over years in that, but, uh, I think my greatest, um, and it's not like you said, the joy, um, you know, what, as I kind of mentioned to you, my story, when I, when I put in for the principal job, it was bittersweet um, because I loved being in the classroom. When I moved to the superintendency, it was bittersweet because I loved being a principal. And so, you know, I, I try and be out and about quite a bit simply because I still love walking in the hall and seeing the students. I still love walking by um, um, classroom doors and watching teachers just passionate about teaching kids and watching that light bulb come on. I love watching the activities the kids do. So, you know, I, I just, you know, I just love, um, education. I love seeing kids learn. I love seeing teachers and kids interact and, and them getting excited about what they do. And I think if I didn't love those things, it would be time for me to find something outside of education. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, I, I think they always say, if you've had a bad day as a superintendent, walk down to the pre-K or kindergarten, because that reminds you why you ever went into education. So, you know, I, I just enjoy education. Um, you know, I've told people if there's ever a day I wake up and it seems like a job to me instead of a privilege, I need to find something else and haven't got to that yet. So yeah, that's why I love you so much. Bless you for that. That is awesome. And that message needs to resound. So friends, I want to thank you so much for uh, tuning in with us. I think we've had a just an excellent uh, 30 minutes here on just talking about uh, Illinois education. And and listen, I want to tell you, wherever you're at throughout the state, it's, it's kind of interesting. I'm getting a lot of calls from many wonderful friends and even business owners from the northern part of the state and and they're they're uh, they're calling me saying hey <laughs> such and such a date I'm going to be driving down the past your area I'd like to stop in and say hi and and then I ask the inevitable question well what 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 brings you our way and well we're moving to Tennessee we're moving to Texas we're moving to Florida so listen before you decide to, to move entirely out of Illinois, consider Southern Illinois. We've got an amazing way of life here. It's safe. We've got amazing schools. 
and uh, just uh, give me a call. And instead of stopping by on your on your way out of Illinois, uh, let me introduce you to Southern Illinois because it's an amazing place to work, to raise a family, and to raise your children. So sure. uh, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll be with you again next week for another episode. God bless.